Turn with me, if you would, today to John chapter 5. A real education in many cases, and a, a definitely answer a lot of questions uh, almost wherever you are in your walk with the Lord. I want to talk about judgment. Thank you, Lord. We ask that you would open up our hearts and minds. Open my mouth. Give me a, a better, a greater anointing than I've had over at the guitar today and just help me to bring forth your word in clarity and power and love and soundness of mind and grant that we would get everything we're supposed to get out of this message. Grant that the enemy would be angry. The Holy Spirit would be in complete control and our Lord Jesus and the Father be glorified. We do forbid any evil spirits, any expression whatsoever in this place. In Jesus' name, be gone from us and do not return. We claim God's covering hedge upon us that no evil can penetrate. And again, Holy Spirit, we just commit ourselves to you and, and uh, do what Jesus said you would do. Lead us into all truth. We ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. John chapter 5, verse 24. These verses, uh, I'm going to read through verse 30. Really bless me as a young Christian when I came to the conclusion that we already have eternal life as believers in Jesus Christ. We're not waiting for some day that we get to heaven or get to the judgment throne of God and he says, well, I don't know. Open the books. And that's not our judgment, that's another judgment. But he looks at us and he says, you're covered in the blood of Jesus. You have no sin to your charge at all. It was paid for at Calvary. Let's read it. 524. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. That's already happened. We just celebrated our 47th anniversary in the Lord about two weeks ago, the 20th of uh, January. We were saved January 20th, 1974. We didn't have any intention of getting saved in 1974 or any other day, but the Lord had an idea. And he broke through our defenses. Mine were a little thicker than Becky's and uh, saved us. And we passed from death into life that very day, that very moment. We felt it, as many of you can testify to. I know a few people have said, well, I don't really know the actual day I was saved or others saved. I remember praying a salvation prayer, but I don't remember anything really happening that day. And, and that, that can be a, a legitimate experience too. But when we ask Jesus into our heart and life, uh, he, we, just, we passed from death into life. We were so excited. We were so happy. We were so filled with something we didn't know what it was that we'd never experienced before. I dug around in the, my books until I found this ancient old King James Bible that I had received from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church over on Lexington Avenue. And uh, as a third grader, paperback, you know, you're, you're, you're not paperback, it was kind of some kind of fancy looking paperback. And I said, let's get the Bible out. And so this was the only Bible we had and we began reading it and we stayed up half the night reading the Bible and just uh, being excited about the Lord. We passed from death into life. It was just an awesome, awesome thing. Jesus goes on to say, most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming 
And now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Notice that because he's the Son of God, he has life in himself, but he's able to be the judge of mankind because he's the Son of Man. You have to come among, from among them. He had to become a human to give himself a sacrifice for humans and to be a leader of humans and the savior of humans and the judge of humans. All judgment is committed to the Son. If you look through every mention of judgment in the whole Bible, you stand before the Son because the Son is the one who became the Son of Man and earned his way, as it were, to be the judge of man. Do not marvel at this, verse 28, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. He's righteous because he doesn't have a dog in this race. He's righteous because he's not looking, to, he's not rooting for anybody or against anybody. He's righteous because he doesn't seek anything for his own benefit but just righteousness. Judgment is a major theme in the Bible. There will be a day of reckoning. In our second job, I often am driving, I'm on the highways all the time, that's what we do. But I know coming just south of Pine City, coming back on 35 towards the cities, there's a billboard, there's a couple of billboards about the Lord up there. And there's one that says, you will meet God. <laughs> you will meet God. You can ignore it, you can say I don't believe in him, but that doesn't make his existence and his reality any less true. And his word is true. And you will meet God. You will pay for your sins. When you hurt somebody, when you cheat somebody, when you steal from somebody, when you purposely go out of your way to make somebody uncomfortable, you will pay for it. That is true even for saints. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. By believing in Jesus, you have eternal life and you've passed from life, from death to life. By not believing in Jesus, you've sealed your fate to still be in death. But whether you're saved or unsaved, when you meet God, you will be judged according to your works. The Christians will be saved. The non-Christians will be lost, but the degree of their punishment or rewards will be decided according to their works. So we know that we're not saved by our works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God, but we're rewarded according to our works too, and I'm gonna show you these scriptures as we go on. I'm just kind of throwing them out there right now to get you prepared. No one gets away with anything in this world. I've read stories about Saddam and his sons and the things they did 
to the citizens of Iraq in their torture chambers in the basements of their mansions. Each son and Saddam himself had several mansions and they included torture rooms where they would torture political opponents or just pretty girls who weren't an opponent to anything. And it's just an awful thing and I think, God, how can people like that ever pay for their sins? God is righteous. Those helpless women will be vindicated and their torturers will be judged. According to their works. I remember a couple got saved in our church at one point and, and uh, were just excited about being saved and they went to visit the husband's grandmother and she, when they got to the doorstep, she wouldn't let them in the house. She opened the door and then slammed it back shut. She said, you get out of my holy house, you devils. She was a good Catholic lady. And she'd been taught that there was only one church that you could be saved in. So they got saved in a uh, charismatic church. And she didn't know much about that. She just knew that they were devils and that they couldn't come into her holy house. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a different judgment for her than there is for Saddam's sons. She rejected Christ. Unless she changed her mind somewhere along the way, we she doesn't have much hope for eternal life. We got to think about these things sometimes. We have relatives and friends like this. Relatively moral, decent people, but don't believe in God or don't believe in Christ. And have never had a conversion experience. Except you be converted, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. But you will be judged according to your works. The little old grandma and the evil sons of, of darkness like Saddam's and all the other despots of the world. They're going to get a whole different judgment. Hitler was responsible for at least 55 million lives. He's going to have a lot to pay for. Mao, I could go through the statistics and blow you away. It's incredible. Stalin, like 75 million. Mao, 90 million. Killed. You don't get away with anything, even though they, all those seem to get away with everything. They were on top of their world. They could do whatever they wanted. They were the law. It's really scary where our country is, and I don't want to talk about politics because I'll tell you right now, we have to win everybody. Do our best to win Democrats, Libertarians, Republicans, whatever. But it's scary that all the power is in one camp now, and they are using that to change our entire system of government from capitalism and democracy to socialism. Venezuela tried that 10 years ago, 12 maybe. They, they were one of the more prosperous countries in the Latin America because of their oil, they have the largest reserves of oil of any country in the world. Far more than Saudi Arabia, etc. And they had, had beautiful, the city of Caracas was just built up beautiful and lovely. And the people had a high uh, standard of living and a, a middle class and upper middle class. And it was just going wonderful. And then Hugo Chavez came into power 
And he decided we are not going to be a stinking capitalist American type country. We, and, you know, isn't that what they're saying now? We're going to be a socialistic country. Today, the, I think it's called the Bogota or the medium of exchange, which used to be about seven or eight Bogotas to a dollar, is now like three and a half million. It's literally the situation where you can bring a whole barrel full of money to the store and buy half a loaf of bread. The average uh, Venezuelan citizen has lost 19 pounds. So that's a, like a, combi a total of 40 million pounds on the Venezuelan socialist diet. Do you want to live in a place like that? It's really scary. It's really scary. And just a few people hold all the billions. And the rest of us are slowly put out of work as the economy crumbles. We need to pray for this nation. I would expect a rousing cheer of amens for that. But they will be judged. They villainized Trump. Well, Trump will be judged. And Biden will be judged. And the people who really control his strings will be judged also. You don't get away with anything. And you don't lose your reward for doing anything good. Anything righteous, noble, godly, helpful. Every little old lady the Boy Scout led across the street. He's going to get credit for. The offering you gave when you knew the church was hurting. Or the missionaries had needs. But you gave that offering even though you really didn't have it to give. You will be rewarded. 30, 60, and 100 fold. That means to the degree that you gave in pain, you could receive 100 times more than you gave in glory. Now, I don't think there's a whole lot of dollars in heaven, but the rewards are commensurate with that. They're, you know, you're going to receive at least 100 times the rewards for whatever you did right. Sometimes you just feel like there's no recognition, no rewards. Maybe you're just one of those faithful people at church and God bless you, who prays earnestly for the church and, and uh, serves in some way that's behind the scenes and Half the people don't know your name, but you're keeping this place running. God sees. God sees and God will reward you many times over for what you did good in this world, in your life. For your works in the body, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You'll be rewarded for your works in the body. Now, I'm, I'm up in front. It looks like I'm the big shot, but when you're a big shot over 14 people, that's not very big. I quit going to pastor's meetings because they quit respecting me a long time ago. At, at one time, I had the largest charismatic church in St. Paul. And I was somebody. And people invited me to come speak at their churches. I even spoke at my home church several times, Jesus People Church. It's something sitting before 3,000 or standing before 3,000 people and speaking. I stood before more than that a few times in India. But when you go to a pastor's meeting and, and you, know, you travel down to 
Colorado to attend a leadership meeting or seminar of some kind and you sit down at the table and you get to know each other in the little groups they set you in to get to know each other. They said, oh, are you a pastor? Yes. Well, how many people are in your congregation? First question every time. How many people do you have? Well, uh, probably a hundred all told if they ever came all to church on one same day. Oh, one woman actually patted my hand and said, I'm sorry. I said, I hope that those hundred people aren't sorry. You, sometimes you feel like you're just not recognized, just not rewarded, just, you know, like you work real hard and, and nobody says thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the people who told me last week it was a good sermon. I think there was three of them. But usually there isn't. And I don't want you to come up and say thank you this week, okay? But... Sometimes you just feel, but God is watching. God is watching and God will reward us. There's more than one judgment mentioned in the Bible. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There's two right there. There's actually a third one. And so before I tell every story in my log, I'll get into the meat of this message. He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from life into death. Glory to God. I'm going to skip some of these scriptures. Um, this would be point number one. If we're talking about judgment, there's three basic judgments. There's the judgment seat of Christ. There's the great white throne judgment. And there's the judgment of nations. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. It would be nice if you could look at that and or I guess it gets flashed up there faster than you usually can find your Bible anyway. Second Corinthians 5, 9 <clears throat> and 10. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in, his bo in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In every major city and major, uh, not even, even smaller cities throughout the Roman Empire, there was a bema, it was right in the heart of town, and it was an outside judging altar. And that's what is translated judgment seat here. We must all stand before Jesus Bema, the judgment seat, and be rewarded for the things done in the body. That could be this human body, that could be the body of Christ. Probably in the context, it, it leans more towards the body of Christ. But the body of human, your body, you do good things and bad things that have nothing to do with going to church, don't you? So you will uh, receive rewards according to the things you did in the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. <clears throat> Paul is uh, comparing the church to a building that God is building. Paul, as an apostle, was the first man on the scene who founded the church. 
And he says in verse 10, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, according to the grace of God, which is given, was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And another builds on it. As the apostle, as the church planter, he laid a foundation for a church that should last for a long time and do a lot of good works for Christ. But other people begin building on the foundation that he laid. I've laid a few foundations in my life as well. Um, our first church in St. Paul, our church in Milwaukee, several churches and uh, small village home meetings in India. And uh, I laid the foundation. That, that's why we call our missions arm Master Builder. In fact, before St. Paul believers existed, Master Builder existed because that's what Becky and I were. We were master, when we were missionaries, we were Master Builder Ministries. Anyway, and that's because we planted a church and then other people built on it. But he says, let each take heed how he builds on it, verse 10. 11, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, when, when, when we come into this church and relate to each other and do the various ministries that we're involved in, people are downstairs right now preparing the food and making sure everything is good so by the time, and ready and hot and all that that needs to be. Uh, so by the time we're done with church, we come down there and they say, this one's a little hot and blah, blah, but you may eat. It's ready to go because somebody is ministering on this foundation. And when you pray for the church, you're building on this foundation. When you share the gospel and invite people to church, you're building on the foundation. When you get your feelings hurt and get miffed at some other person in church and tell a friend or two about it, it's duly noted you're, that's what your work on this foundation is. So good or bad, we are, like he said, whether good or bad, we're gonna be re, uh, rewarded for the things done in the body. And here in 1 Corinthians, if we build on this foundation, verse 12, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will, teach, will test each one's work of what sort it is. So when you're building in the, uh, on the foundation, there's two kinds of materials you can use. Those that don't burn, and those that do burn. Gold, silver, precious stones, they do not burn. They get more pure with fire. The precious stones are created by intense pressure and fire and heat. So when you build out of that, and, that if, and somehow at the judgment seat of Christ, it's tested by fire, I don't know if we stand in front of a blowtorch it's, sim it's you know, uh, symbolic, of course. But what kind of things did you build? If you prayed, you were building with gold. If you preached the gospel, you were building with silver, etc. I think of people that uh, build beautiful buildings, and we're in a beautiful building. Most people really get surprised when they find an independent charismatic church in a building like this. In fact, a lot of independent charismatic people walk in and don't feel comfortable. And I know when we first moved into this place, it was like pulling teeth trying to get people to worship the Lord. They just felt like going, we beseech thee to hear us, O God. And, and start doing rituals and stuff. Nobody really did that, but it, just, it was just like a stunt. A 
blocking of our worship until we got used to it. Until one night the band decided, this is not working. This is about 2004. And after several months of that, the band, we, just, we were just not having a very good practice. And we said, let's pray. And we prayed and we bound all those religious spirits with all the beautiful wood imported from Germany. This stuff was all carved by German artisans. This, this marble altar has got to be worth I don't know how much. And all these wonderful stained glass windows. You, they don't make stained glass windows like this anymore because nobody can afford them. But it was at the height of German uh, art, artistry when these were built in 1935 to 1937. Now you do see some stained glass, but it's big splashes of this and that. Look at our cross back there. There was a beautiful Christ on the cross back there. And they said, we want to bring, the, the church that sold it to us, said we want to bring our stained glass Christ on the cross to our new church. And it takes the front and center place in their new church which is modern and all that. And uh, they said, but we'll pay for a stained glass thing here. But, well, that's what we got. That's how they make it nowadays. The point of it is, this is really fancy, but you know what it's going to get you at the judgment seat of Christ? No eternal value. No eternal value. In fact, people who live in the realm of eternity and love God walk into the place and feel quenched. <laughs> Negative eternal value. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But we will be rewarded for everything we do, good or bad. Remember that. That should be uh, something we think of often. and We shouldn't walk around being afraid of God's judgment. But at the same time, we should do our best in everything we do. Well, so that in, in consciousness that we're going to be rewarded. If I speak harshly to Becky, I'm going to have to pay for that. You abused your wife. I never abused my wife. I never raised a hand to her. Well, you raised your voice a few times few times too many, especially when you were younger. Oh, well, I matured since then. Oh, so she had to only go through 15 years of that instead of 50. Now, I'm not saying I really did that, and I'm sure you don't believe I did. But we need to think of things like that. We need, to think, we need to think when we're talking to unbelievers, are we making a positive or a negative impact on them? I, I, like you, I'm assuming you're like me, I've had a lot of bad attitudes during my life as a Christian about the kind of behavior I see around me from the kid driving down the street with his radio blasting or with, that booms the windows in our house to just all the nasty way that people are conducting themselves. I remember a pastor, we actually, we, I, I, I want to figure out how to say this without, we, on furlough from India came to a church and visited there and the pastor had held a wedding the day before and then during his sermon during the course of his sermon he was uh, speaking about how lewdly the girls were dressed at the wedding he said I couldn't hardly believe it and he just went on and on ranting and some people can get to this into this holiness thing where they lose perspective entirely the point wasn't that there was unbeliever girls who were young and pretty and dressing to show it off. 
the, the point, and, and that should grieve you because it's not Christian behavior. Well, they're not Christians. And you should be looking, and, and, and I do do this. I honestly have to say that when I do a funeral or a wedding, what I see is a whole bunch of people that normally are not in my church, and they're going to get the good news. There's no way they're getting away from a sermon by Kim Harrington without hearing how to get right with God. And I don't care how they're dressed. When I was younger, I may have noticed a little more than I do now. But I don't, it, that is just so beside the point. Svetlana, one of our daughters and I were cleaning my office at home yesterday. And we found some old photo albums. Oh, never do that. The, the rest of the work just got set aside for the rest of the day. But anyway, she said, oh, who's that? And who's that? And, and oh, mom was really pretty when she was younger. She still is. I know, I know. Anyway, and uh, sorry, Beck. She's in the kitchen. That was a joke, son. And I said, oh, who is that? And she said, and I said, oh, that's Jesse. At, we were there at Jesus People Church when we, before we started our first church when she got saved. And it was quite the altar call. Pastor gave the altar call, and she and about three of her friends went strutting up the aisle dressed like harlots. Because that's exactly what they were. And she was beautiful, and, and they all were, you know. And uh, she gave her heart to the Lord. And she ended up, when we started our church, she ended up coming to our church. And uh, she was the most on fire girl for the Lord. And she uh, later on, uh, you know, wonderful history. She's got a lot of good things, good rewards at the judgment seat of Christ for everything she did from conversion on. And, uh, but you would, to, what, what if you judge her and say, well, you can't dress like that and come forward to an altar call? And a lot of churches believe that. That you have to clean up before you can be saved. I asked one pastor down in San Antonio, I was preaching at his church. I ended up preaching in every church of God in San Antonio within a week and a half that I was spending down there. And, and he was like the district superintendent, so he took me all these churches. And I said, well, what is the difference between the church of God and the assembly of God? And he said, the assembly of God believes that you get baptized in the Holy Ghost to get holy. And the church of God and he smiled because that was him, believes that when you get holy enough, you'll get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay. We just want to save people. We just want to do positive things in the kingdom of God. And we will be rewarded, plus or minus, for that. For our works or lack thereof. Number two, the judgment of the nations. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. This is a big section of reading, so you may want to turn to it yourself. I usually preach from the New King James. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shep shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. 
I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now, this can be applied to individuals, especially some of the uh, examples he uses, but it's generally called the judgment of the nations. Well, scholars and theologians agree that uh, this isn't exactly the same uh, like the white throne judgment because he does that a thousand years later. We'll talk about that next. But this is the nation's what you know, Jesus comes. He destroys the Antichrist and his army. He throws Satan, the, uh, the false prophet and uh, uh, Antichrist into the lake of fire. He puts Satan in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And now he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. Got it? What about the rest of the world? Which nations get to come into the millennial reign or get favor before the Lord or whatever it may entail? I, we don't have the details. The Bible talks a lot about judgment. It's really hard to nail down the time span and different things like that and the details. But this seems to be, and like I said, the scholars agree, a, a judgment of nations. And the criteria for their judgment is how they treated God's Jesus brethren. Okay? In that you did it to the least of these, my brethren. Let's reach, read the next few verses. And the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The criteria for the nations as they stand before God is how did you treat my brethren? I believe that's obviously the Christians, the born again Christians. The, the non born again Christians, many will join the church of the false prophet and worship the Antichrist. The Bible talks about the judgment of that false church. Revelation 17, Babylon the harlot. But the nations themselves, how did they treat the believers or and, and or the Jewish people? Isn't it amazing how many people have, how many nations have decided, let's persecute the Jews? Nobody all of a sudden says, let's persecute all the Azerbaijanis or Nigerians or, God forbid, Canadians. One of the largest countries in the world and Nobody even knows what they do up there. <laughs> That's a joke, son. I've been to Canada several times. But uh, not, um, anyway. Um, how did you treat, why do people treat the Jews bad? Because Satan knew that from the seed of the woman, and then it was narrowed down to the seed of Abraham, and finally narrowed down to the seed of Jacob, the original Israelite, that the Messiah would come and defeat the enemy. And so he tried, he persecuted the Jews in hopes that he would kill off the Messiah before he came of age and slew the devil. Now he must just be really desperate because after all his defeats, you would think he would know you're not going to win against God. But you know, there's people like you and me that still somehow think they're going to win against God. Maybe he isn't looking right now. But be that as it may, the Jews have been persecuted by all the major nations down through the years. It's getting very serious again in Europe. I don't know how up to date you are on some of these things. I'm not totally up to date, but I, 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 you know, 
I'm semi-aware. And uh, in France, Muslim, radical Muslims just walk up to old Jewish couple going on the way to synagogue and just run them through with a knife, stick it back under their robe and keep going. And nobody even notices until 45 seconds later, they notice this old couple laying on the ground. And that's happening daily in France. Germany is almost in full bore anti-Semitism again. This is the nation that gave us Hitler, and we like to feel sorry for the German people that they had to uh, serve under him and live under him, but they're doing the same thing today. They're anti-Jewish. For what reason? The only reason is because Satan still doesn't like him. So the, I would think in these, my brethren, we could put the Jews in there too. So these nations will be judged, the nations of the world will be judged on how they treated Christians and Jews. How does China treat Christians? They throw them in jail and they kill them. How does Saudi Arabia treat Christians? There are none. Bibles are forbidden to be in Saudi Arabia. You can't have a personal Bible. If you're an American serviceman serving in Saudi Arabia, protecting their interests from Al-Qaeda and all the other things going on, you cannot have a Bible in the barracks. They're, they might be a semi-ally ally to America, but there's certainly no ally of God. We see ourselves at a crossroads in our own nation. Our last president, you can think good or bad of him, but he did, he enacted hundreds of presidential orders and different things that made life easier for Christians. As far as I know, he's never claimed to be a born-again Christian, but he surrounded himself with born-again Christians, including his vice president. And he did pro-Christian things during his whole four years in office. And pro-Jewish things, said America is going to, to acknowledge Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, not Tel Aviv. So America is in a good place. But going quickly to a place where the Christians are being resisted. A lot of uh, Biden's presidential orders you know, have uh, gone against the church, various Christian interests and such. Definitely uh, Jewish, against the Jews. And I, I could give more details, but I don't want to. If you've watched the news, you're aware of these things. So this is how the nations will be judged. Isaiah mentions it, by the way. In the Old Testament, you find out a lot. You, you see a lot of prophecies about Christ uh, judging the nations. Isaiah 2, 4. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. He's going to judge the nations between the nations, good and bad, and then he's going to institute a thousand year reign where we're farming and living a pastoral existence that we were meant to live. Psalm 96 for he is coming, he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples, that's the nations again, with his truth. Depending on how those nations, and I don't know how it turns out to individual people in those nations that may have been believers or, you know, like China has a large Christian, uh, Christian minority, but uh, we know that China itself has a policy against Christians. Okay, finally, 
the great white throne judgment. Three judgments. The first one is the Christians standing before God, not learning if they're saved or lost. They're already saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, through being born again, have passed from death to life the moment you were, gave your heart to Jesus. But judge for the works you did in the body. Then the judgment of the nations, judged on the criteria of how they treated Christ's people. And the great white throne judgment happens a thousand years after the second coming of Jesus. It says in Revelation 20, verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven flew, fled away. And this is, by the way, him who sat on it is, is uh, Christ, because he's the Son of Man and the Son of God. And there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and books were opened. And another book opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea, sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. When it says death and Hades, death is your soul. And Hades is your body. I, I might have that turned around. Never mind. Cross that out. You have the books of, these, of everybody's works. And then you have the book of life. And if they're not written, if their name is not written in the book of life, then they're cast into the sea of fire there, the lake of fire, also known as Gehenna. Okay. But you're not just indiscriminately taught, tossed in there, like I said, this little old grandma with her holy house and Adolf Hitler. They're not just thrown in next to each other. They're thrown, they're put in, whether there's varying temperatures in the lake of fire, I don't know. But they're judged according to the works in the books. The, work, the name in the book is what counts as to whether you go to heaven or hell. Uh, at this judgment, there won't be many people that go to heaven because they were judged a thousand years earlier. But it's Believable that some people would live during the millennial period and be saved and others would be lost, etc., etc. But all of the souls from time, from the beginning of time until a thousand years after the second coming will stand before Jesus and he will open up the books, which is the books of our works. And they will be judged. They'll be thrown in the lake of fire, but, they, but the, the degree of punishment will depend on what is written in the books. Jesus talked about that, that some people will receive many stripes, some people will receive few in judgment. They'll all receive stripes, and in this case, they'll all uh, go into the lake of fire, but there's varying degrees of punishment depending on what is found in the books. I don't want any of my loved ones ever to stand at the white throne judgment. A lot of us are concerned about our parents and people who, in my case, my father died before I was a Christian. But as I began looking at it, I realized that he was the best Lutheran he knew how to be. And he did nothing but good works. He built the parsonage, he built the Sunday school wing, he, he, he was always working at the church, and no money, no pay. And uh, he was a righteous man. I found 
Uh, my grandpa, his father, was converted to a Lutheran when he married my grandmother. And they made him go through catechism. And he had to study for months and months before he would pass all the tests about faith or salvation by faith in Jesus Christ and all of the articles of Luther's catechism and all that, which if you ever read that, it's, it's great. The problem today in many Lutheran churches is everyone just assumes we're all okay. And, and they're not really doing all those things that Luther taught. Luther wouldn't have been in trouble with the authorities that be if he would have just taught religion. Anyway, my grandpa was converted and became very devout. I have his letters that he wrote to his wife, my grandma, when he, during the war. And, uh, and just, this man was a man of God. He's praying constantly. I'm talking, cool, cool. And I knew him as a very just man. Now I know why after reading his letters. Anyway, I have reason to believe that my father, my grandfather are in heaven. So just because they didn't go to the right church or say, I'm born again, doesn't mean they weren't. Just a little different terminology and such. So there's, I always find when we're burying a relative or something, that there is some place where God gives us a hope. But at the same time, we don't want to take any chances. While it is within our reach, we need to ensure that all of our loved ones will be going to heaven and will never stand before the great white throne where the decision is made, how bad were you before we throw you in the lake of fire? The justice of it, people really have a hard time with this. It's the single biggest stumbling block to Christianity in the world. Keeps more people from coming to Christ than anything else, the existence of hell. And it makes Christians stumble too. We can't see that how would an eternity in hell be due to somebody who, not, put Hitler in there for sure. Sodom's sons, good, good. But a little old grandma with her holy house. But I have come to one thing and it's very simplistic. If I love them, how much more does God love them? And God knows justice from every angle. He knows the hearts, he knows the intentions, he knows everything about us. And if he is judging somebody in what seems harsh to us, there's some really good reasons. I trust God. That's what being a Christian means. I trust God. The same word for believe in the New Testament can be translated trust. When you believe in him, you, you trust him. I believe he is the kind of person that I can follow all my life and throughout eternity. And I can trust his judgments. I'm not gonna start questioning the things I don't understand because if I could understand them, I'd be God and that'd be idolatry. Can I hear an amen? amen? Would you like me to tell a few stories before we close this service? Let's stand. Have I ever told you about Tong Zhong and his getting baptized in the Holy Spirit? That came up yesterday. She said, my, Sveta says, who's this Asian guy in your book here? And I said, oh, that's Tong, Tong Zhong. And she said, oh, the guy that got baptized in the Holy Spirit? And yep, yep that's the guy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we do have wonderful, wholesome, happy testimonies. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your word that 
helps us understand your ways and, and, and prepare for judgment and be ready. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being merciful. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name. Amen. The grace of